Your worship here ought to come with a warning label. <laughs> Serious. Um, you don't know me for the most part, um, but I go a long way. Diane and I go a long way back with Roger and Angel and Kent and Shay. Um, we experienced something that, uh, growing up all of my life in church, I cut my teeth on church pew. Hi, how are you, Silas? That's my grandson, sorry. Um, all of my life I grew up in church and heard about God doing great things. And then it happened in our county in kind of inexplicable ways. God doesn't always do things well, God never does anything in the pattern that we think it ought to look like. And he did this great thing. Um, but I also had a fault line that ran through my life that led to just a disastrous outcome for me and for our ministry. And so I spent 20 years pursuing God in ministry. I've now spent 20 years in the marketplace. My, my life has been divided smack in two by failure. And it's only been in the last few years, and Diana were talking on the way here, that we came home and realized that the presence of God in a certain experience is home for us. When we came here a few months ago, we, you know, we, were, we thought about it so many times about coming, but it wasn't easy for us. It wasn't easy for me. To show up anywhere in this town, in this area. But when we heard that Robbie was coming, we decided to come and God did some amazing things. Some of you were here and you probably remember I got kind of wrecked. Um, <laughs> and we knew that God was calling us to come and, and connect in some way back here with Roger and Angel. And I just want to honor your pastor because these two are warriors. There aren't many pastors who will commit themselves to host the presence of God no matter how it looks. And no matter how many rules of church growth it breaks. <laughs> there aren't many. Because most guys want the seats full of people. Roger and Angel wants the seats full of God. And I sense that every time I come here. We come here and, and we see this generational thing happen with these three crazy anointed worship leaders. Good Lord. And, and that comes from an old worship leader. These, you, you have no idea the well that you have here in worship. You, you don't have a clue. If you did, you'd all act like Kent. <laughs> I'm telling you. Whatever freedom that man has to be who God made him to be, we all need a dose of it. We do. We do. So, um, Roger asked if we would share, and, um, and I felt that God said yes, and I have contended for several weeks now for you. Hope, I have heard from heaven for you. I don't know how I'm going to get it out because it's been wrecking me for days. So y'all going to have to pray for me because I don't even know. But God has something he wants to accomplish today. And I think part of that is my, my wife heard um, from the Lord a word that she wants to give you. And I think she's supposed to. So we get a microphone for her. Um, I t she kept saying, I don't know if I'm supposed to give this in front of everybody. And I said, yeah, you are, because I think it's a God thing. You need to hear this, and I think you need to hear this. This is Diane, the love of my life. Some of you know me from my whale. <laughs> Can I say this? Woo. Anyway, so I was praying, and it, I was, it was in the night. You, you know how that is. And everybody gets words different ways. Um, some people get it in quiet time, some people, I always, it's always strange for me. And so I said, Lord, give me a word for Roger and Angel. Let it be sweet and wonderful, you know, big and flowery and, and loving and pretty. Hang on, I've got humility because you guys are a 
to observe humility. You are faithful. You have dug the well. But this is the word the Lord gave me, and it was all in black caps. S-T-E-E-L, steel. And I came immediately, and I said, why steel? And the Lord said, because it has the ability to hold and carry weight. And if you know anything about the glory of God in, in the Hebrew. old mm -hmm. language, it means weightiness, it means weight, the glory of God. So this is the word, um, that you have the ability to host, the ability to carry, and the ability to hold up the glory of God like a banner. And so you will not, doesn't mean you won't be weak. But then I looked up, after I received that, I looked up, what does heat do to steel? This simple act of heated to an exact, an exact temperature range can create a more pure hard metal. It is often used to create steel that is stronger than the standard metal. So heat can indeed make metal weaker. However, there are many processes where metal is strengthened by heat. So the fire that you have been through has been to make you stronger in him because what he wants you to carry is heavier than you've ever known. It's heavier than you thought about. It's heavier than you've dreamed about. It's heavier than you've hoped for. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, if, you're, if you've got a Bible and you want to do this, I'm going to mess with you guys that look at them on your phones and stuff because you, you can't put your finger on your phone. But put your finger in Acts chapter 1 and your other finger in, 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 in Ephesians chapter 1. I feel like the Lord wants to lift our eyes and help us understand what we can experience if we're willing to be full of him. My father, my heavenly father, is a dreamer. Yeah. He has always had a dream. And a lot of people think that Jesus was the fulfillment of that dream. But he wasn't. He was the foundational prototype of the dream. You are the finished product. See, you don't track the dream of God to a garden and a fall. That's what a lot of us do. Because we have such a high view of the cross, and we should, we sometimes believe the dream of God was the cross resurrection event where Jesus came and he did this incredible thing and he bought for all of us our redemption and we have peace with God through that so we think that's the dream but it wasn't it was God's way to get the dream back on track because you see if you've got to if you want to understand the dream of God you've got to go farther back than the garden and the fall because God goes way back before then so get a picture with me God, as we understand him in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, however that works, in eternity past, had an image, an idea, a dream. He had an understanding of what he wanted to do, and it was enormous. It was the dream of God was in the heart of God before the foundations of the world. Think about this. Before he ever spun a star into the sky, before he ever dug out earth and made a valley and piled it up and made a mountain, before he dropped salty brine into an ocean, before he popped up a pine tree out of the forest, or before he put an animal, even the smallest insect on the earth, before he breathed into a mud pie and called it a man, before any of that, our father had a dream. He had this idea. And all of history is his story 
telling how he's moving everything to the fulfillment of the dream. And in the middle of that story, he actually enters the story that he's writing in order to bring the story back so that it can go on. That's what the cross resurrection did for us. So before he dreamed up redemption, he had a dream. Think about that. Can you, can you imagine anything more beautiful than Jesus? Can you imagine anything? God can. And he did. What is that dream? I thought about it and I thought, what kind of a, an idea would drive the eternal God to make the world, allow us to break the world, come into the world to fix the world, and then drive all of history toward the fulfillment of the dream. What kind of an idea is that? That's where we go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. I was reading this some weeks ago, and it started this whole journey, and I feel like it's for all of us, but it's for you. Ephesians 3.10, Paul tells us about a mystery hidden in history that is filled with destiny. He, he talks about this mystery. I can almost see the old guy bald like I am and like Roger is. I don't know if you knew that, but Paul was bald. That's all, all God's great guys are. Um, <laughs> I can see this old guy and he's getting lost talking to a scribe, whoever's scribbling this stuff down, about this mystery of eternity. And then he stops and he looks at the guy and he says, his intent, this is verse 10, his intent, his dream, was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known before the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to the eternal purpose he accomplished in our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about those words with me. His intent, his purpose, his dream, this idea that was driving him was that now, not in heaven, not when everything is fixed in the end of time and sin is gone and Satan is dis destroyed and we're all perfect. N not then. Yeah, yeah. Now. Yeah. That now, through the church, that's us. Think about this. God's dream is that now, through us, wrecked as we are, some of you have testimonies. I have a mestimony, man. I mean, it's awful. As we are, his dream is to make known his manifold wisdom. The word manifold is this Greek word that means multicolored, multidimensional. Multi Think of a diamond, and every, everywhere you turn it, there's a different facet, a different prism of light. He said, I want to make known my own multidimensional person now in this world through you. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, I want the angels of heaven and the rulers of darkness to watch me do it. <laughs> Think about this. His intent was that now, through the church, he would make known more of who he is than all of heaven can know. Think about this. When he uses the words rulers and authorities, those are big words, okay? If, if you think about heaven, he is called the Lord of hosts. I love that, that, that message, God of angel armies, okay? So God has this whole realm of created beings that live in a reality that surrounds and is bigger than our reality. Got it? Part of that breaks off and becomes the dark principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world that we contend with in prayer. So in the reality that surrounds our reality, there are angels and powers and rulers and authorities. And God's dream is for them to learn about him through you. 
we're angel school. <laughs> we're angel school. How cool is that? I was telling Diane, we were talking about different ways that we've seen God move. And I said, every time something happens where a person, no matter how frail or broken they are, gets it and does a kingdom thing, God says to the angels, watch and learn. That's more of me than you know. And here's what got me. He's teaching more of himself to creatures that he created who exist in his presence. They're right here in God. And yet he says, you don't have a clue about my multi-dimensional, multifaceted nature. Why? Because you can't know some things those boys and girls down there can know. An angel can never know what it's like to have God reach down into a rehab center and pull a drug addict out and change his life. An angel can never know God, what God does when he reaches onto the streets and pulls a prostitute out of her prostitution and makes her pure and righteous again. He, he, the angel can never know what it's like to grab a guy that's addicted to pornography and ungodly relationships and pull them back up and change their heart and their life. The angels can never know that stuff. That's why the Bible talks about when we get to heaven, there's a song angels can't sing. It's called the Song of the Redeemed. There will come a moment in history, in the eternities, when God will stand at his throne and silence the worship of the angels that's been going on since creation. And he will say, you got to hear this one. And we will sing the song of the redeemed. No angels can do that because they can't know what we know about God unless we tell them. As we do the things that God has created us to do, the heavens are instructed about... I can see the Father look down and say, watch this. Watch this. As we get close to doing something right, once in a while, as we nudge up against it, I can see the Father go, oh, here it comes. Here comes the kingdom. Here comes the kingdom. And I can see Jesus, when it happens, high-five the Father and go, they look just like me. They look just like me. And the father goes, that was the whole idea all along. Hmm. By the way, when I look, look at my watch, it means absolutely nothing. Nothing. Don't get any ideas. I get to preach about three times a year. Add that up. Okay. You see, God has always wanted to have a people that released his life. That was the whole idea behind creation. He took the risk of the fall to get the fulfillment of his dream. Because he said, it's the only way we can do it, guys. We got to let them screw up. We'll bring them back. Because nobody's going to stand in the way of my dream. See, we get stuck sometimes. Please receive this with, with honor. We get stuck sometimes at the cross resurrection. As if we were only made to be redeemed. Yeah, and it's wonderful, isn't it? We celebrate it, we sing, we dance. People wonder why we act like this in worship. Let me tell you something. If you've been where I've been, and God has done for you what God has done for me, you're going to act like a little crazy. You know, the truth and reality is you're going to be crazy. You just have to choose which kind of crazy you're going to be. Look around our world. It's crazy. Right? All I've done is choose to be crazy a different way. So God created us not simply to be redeemed. He redeemed us so that we could become what we were created to be. That's right. 
See, it's bigger. It's higher. It's broader. It's more. In Jesus' physical body on earth, he made God's dream come to life. But in his spiritual body on the earth, he makes God's dream come true. It's us. I was thinking about that passage in Rome and Hebrews 12, where it's a very common scripture. You know it. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. You know that scripture. I've never heard anyone preach it that didn't say the joy set before him was us redeemed. And this week I went, no, it wasn't. The joy set before him was the look on his daddy's face when he walked back into heaven leading captivities captive and the father smiled and said, you did it. Now the dream can become reality. The joy that held him to the cross, held him in a tomb, sent him into hell to wrest the keys of death and hell from the enemy, that joy was the look on his daddy's face. You're daddy, you know that, don't you? You look at your kid and they do... I remember when Caleb, this is my son Caleb, and this is my son Nathan. I'm proud of them so very much. I love you guys. I remember when Caleb was younger, it, I believe that God gives you sons to mow the grass. I, I do. I'm, <laughs> and they, they'll, they'll confirm that. And I remember one time I came home and the grass was mowed. And I hadn't asked. And I asked, who did it? And Caleb said, I did. And I said, why? He said, because I knew you'd want it. I wanted to buy him a Camaro. <laughs> he, he's still waiting on the, the Camaro. <laughs> but a father understands that idea because of the delight the son sees in the father's satisfaction. We used to lead worship together, and I'd turn around and see Nate and Caleb behind me. And they're both phenomenal musicians, and I'm like... Something happened in me, and it was like, oh, this is, this. they had to see the joy in the face of the father when the son is accomplishing his purpose. Daddies, you know what that's like, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus walks into heaven with, according to scripture, captivity in his train. He walks in as the king, the prince, restored, and he walks in and his daddy is smiling from ear to ear, which is big in eternity, okay? That's the joy that was set before him. So as I thought about this, it's a big idea that we could be the dream of God come true. That's a big idea. Especially when I look at us. You know what I mean? I look in the mirror and I go, hmm. A little short of the glory. A little short of the glory. Yeah, a little short of the glory. <laughs> I like that. So, how in the world, how in the world can it happen? Go back now for a minute to Acts chapter 1. Next week, we're going to celebrate the uh, church's birthday, Pentecost. I have a feeling we're going to hear about it at some point during the service. That's my guess, okay? But in Acts chapter 1, before Jesus leaves, and of course then the Spirit comes, Luke writes, he starts writing this book to his friend Theophilus. The name Theophilus means God lover. So he's writing to his friend God lover, and look at what he says. In my former book, that's the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, he wrote 24 chapters from Annunciation to Ascension. He covered the whole gamut. He wrote all about all the miracles and wonders and signs, and he wrote all about all the amazing birth stories that we read at Christmas. He, he wrote it all. But he said, I wrote about what Jesus began to do and teach. So now, Theophilus, I'm going to write you another book because i got another book in me. And this one is how he picked up where he left off. He began in his physical body to do and teach, to show and tell. 
But he isn't done. I have this picture, this amazing picture in my head of Jesus on the cross right before he gives up the ghost and goes and puts hell in its place. He, at the top of what was left left of his breath, he said, it is finished. But when he gathered up all the might in the orbit of his omnipotence, and on the third day kicked a stone out of his way and walked full force into the world again, you know what he said? I am not finished. He was just getting started. So Paul said, or Luke says, I wrote this other book, Luke, I wrote that to you so you would know what God looks like when he looks like us. Now I'm going to write you a book about what we look like when we look like him. It shouldn't be called the Acts of the Apostles. It should be called the Continuing Acts of Jesus Christ through weird people. That's it. See, Luke was saying there's more to come, guys. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was the thing that that allowed God to pull the slingshot back and release his kingdom through people into the earth. So in these days following this, because all through the book of Acts, Jesus continues to show up for his people and show off through his people. In this first chapter, he's setting the stage, and it says that he showed them with many convincing proofs that he was alive. How many of you know stupid runs deep? How many convincing proofs do you need when a guy is standing there that was dead and is alive? Seriously, how many? How many times do you got to go through? Okay, let's go through this again. See, the, 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 you got it? God has no new problems. Idiots are not new to God. It's so encouraging to me. When I get up in the morning and I look in, my, in, my, in the mirror and I go, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> he convinced them that he was alive, and then he, for 40 days, you know what he talked about? The dream. It says that he talked to them for 40 days about the kingdom. He, he, for 40 days, these guys that had been primed and pumped for three years, they had watched him do it. He's now saying, now guys, the whole point of this was not for me to do it. It's for me to show you how to do it. Many of you are not old enough to remember a guy named John Wimber. John Wimber was the founder of the Vineyard Movement. And when he first came to Jesus out of just a rank heathen lifestyle, he read the Bible and he actually believed it. He actually believed it. So he would go to church and he would sit there and after a while he just got tired of it and he walked up after church to the pastor and he goes, hey man, when are we going to do the stuff? The pastor said, what stuff? The Jesus stuff. When are we going to do the Jesus stuff? See, he was foolish enough to believe that Jesus came to show us how the kingdom looks when the kingdom looks like us. So he teaches them about the kingdom and then he says this to them. I want you to go back to Jerusalem and I want you to stay there until the promise of the Father comes and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. I can can almost see him doing this remedially to his disciples. Go back to the upper room. (laughs) Say it with me, upper room. Stay there. There, that room. I can hear it. Why? Because I watched them for three years go out and all try to do it in their own way. And Jesus was saying, look, I know you guys. I know what you're going to do. You're going to go get yourself killed. Here's what I want you to do. Go get full, then go get yourself killed. (laughs) So he tells them, go back and wait. And here's the thing I I want to kind of press in, and I promise I will wrap this up at some point. (laughs) He says to them, go into the room, and you're going to be be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2, verse 4, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So what happened was, 
Jesus goes back to the Father, and the Holy Spirit says, i see you later. And he came, and he brought the very Spirit of Jesus and put it into people like us. And all of a sudden, Jesus became Jesus' assistant. Got it? Little body became the body of Jesus. So after that, all through the book of Acts, when something happens, some God kind of thing happens, it's always precipitated by something like this. And Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, spoke a certain way. And Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, saw the angels in heaven while he's being stoned. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And, and Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit, showed this enormous character of giving and love. And Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, carried the gospel all the way to Caesar. See, all of the book of Acts is about being full. All of life in the kingdom is about being full. Full of the Spirit. Now, we all know that. We've all heard that. We've all read that. So the question remains, and here's where we'll wrap up. What does it mean to be full of the Spirit? Let's go back to Ephesians now. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul sees this as so important that he prays. He prays. And he says he continually prays this. Two different prayers. One is that his people would be full of the life of God, his kind of life. And the second prayer was he prayed that they would be full of his kind of love. Fullness of the Spirit is about being full of his life, full of his love. I love what Bill Johnson says. He says, the Holy Spirit is in you and he wants out. I love that. You are filled with his kind of life and his kind of love. Okay? Ephesians chapter 1. I just want to walk you through this. This is in starting down in uh, verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and this incomparably great power. Now listen to this. He just described for you what the God kind of life looks like. It's a life of intimacy. He said, I'm going to pray that you'll have the power to know him better. It is a life of destiny. I'm going to pray that you will know the hope to which he has called you. We're always called up, guys. Always. Hope is always up. Okay? It is a life of identity. And he said, and I want you to, I want to pray that you'll have the power to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I want to know, I want you to know what you're worth to the Father. And then he says, I want you to know this incomparably great power. That's authority. The life of God is a life of intimacy, destiny, identity, authority. And then listen to how he finishes the prayer. He says, this power, this power that that I'm praying you'll get is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him as at the right hand of the heavenly fathers, far above rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, not not only in the present age but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything, listen to this, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. 
you know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm going to pray that you will be so full of him that you'll be just like Jesus, raised up, given authority over the powers that are below you, seated in intimacy with the Father, and when you do that, you will be the fullness of Christ filling the world. That's the God kind of life. But he doesn't stop there. And I love this part. This is, the, this is actually the verse that got the whole thing going for me weeks ago. It's in Ephesians chapter 3. Right after he tells us about the dream, that it's God, that we're angel school, that dream, he says this, verse 14, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. This is an aside, but I want to stop there. This struck me this morning. There would be no Thompson family if he hadn't spoken it. There would be no Jimenez family. There would be no Hackenberg family. You get it? There'd be no Maholic family. Why? Because every family on earth is brought into being when it is spoken from the Father, which means every lineage on the planet has a destiny and a purpose and the enemy is completely committed to destroying your family line. Every family on earth, every family, you go, you ain't seen my family yet. You say, every family, you know, you ought to see this bunch. Look, we all are crazy in a group of crazies called family. I get that. Some a little crazier than others. But the bottom line is every family was spoken by the Father with a destiny and a purpose. And what happens to that destiny between one generation and another generation is it amplifies. So if there is brokenness in a generation, it amplifies in the next and it amplifies in the next and it amplifies in the next. However, when a generation of people stands and says, this stops here, now, then the kingdom of God moves in and amplifies generation after generation after generation. Why do you think these three kids lead worship? Because some generation said, no more. This is going a different direction. I pray to God some of you get that and stand up and become the generation in your lineage that says this family was spoken by God and he will receive his sufferings. That wasn't part of the sermon, so we got to go on. Um, I pray that out of his glorious riches... He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I love this. Here it is. And I pray that being rooted and established in love, you may have power together with all the saints to know what? The breadth and length and depth and height of God's love which is beyond knowing. I want you to have the spiritual capacity to grasp things that are ungraspable, to put your arms around things too big for you. I want you to know how big the love of God is. I want you to know it. See, he wants us to be carriers of his presence. He said, so that you'll know what it is that Jesus actually lives inside of you. But he also wants us to be conduits of his hope. You, my friends, are a conduit of his hope to this region. He says, I want you to know, and play along with me here. I don't think those four things are a poetic way that Paul says, or that, that, that Luke, excuse me, Paul says, I want you to know how big God's love is. He specifically says, breadth, length, depth, height. Why? Because if I know the breadth of God's love, I'll know how big it is. And that will make me a risk taker. Because I've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. Got it? 
if I know the length, then I know how long it will last. And I'll understand it doesn't end with me. This is a generational thing that goes on and on and on. The dream of God for your family is too big for your generation. Yeah. What God has for me is supposed to work itself out in my children and my grandchildren. It's bigger yeah. than you. Yeah. To know the depth yeah. is to know how far it will go. If I know the length of it, I'll become a history maker. If I know the depth of it, I'll become a chain breaker. Let me tell you something. I know how far he'll go. One thing God has never said, Kent, is I won't go there. Not one, not one time, not one situation has God ever said, I won't go there. Never. Because you'll never know. You'll never plumb the depth of his love. And then the height. That means I know where it's from. So if I know that, I'm going to be a planet shaker. Because Jesus had taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I know where it's from and I know where it's coming. All right, so here it is. And I promise this is it. He closes this prayer with these words. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than you could ever ask. Or Im now that is saying something because I got a big asker and I've got a bigger imagination. But here's what he's saying. You can never ask as big as God is, and you can never imagine as much as God dreams for you. Woo! Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly, immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. Listen to this. To him be glory in the church. Now, and forever to all generations why has that song the blessing done what it's done because it's to your children and their children and their children he said listen you have yet to discover what I can do through a person full of my kind of life yeah. and my kind of love. Yeah. You don't even have a clue. It's immeasurably more. So here's the deal. You're sitting there going, well, that was, that was big. Big idea. So what? That's what my wife always says. What's that mean? <laughs> Let's bring it back down. What's that mean? You might be sitting there looking at your life and saying there's nothing more ordinary Nothing more plain than my life. You might be looking at your life going, I'm too young. I've done too much wrong. I got a screwed up family. You might be like me. I'm more 60 than he is. <laughs> Sometimes I get up in the morning and go, I'm, I'm too old for this. Now, Unto him who is able. I'll tell you this story real quick. I've said that about 15 times already. Yeah. It'll be longer next time, I'm telling you. I promise you. A, a, a thing that has been stirring in Diane and I is the story of Caleb, after whom my son is named, my middle son is named. Caleb was a man of faith that like Joshua saw the land came back and honestly said what it was like it's incredible there's some big guys there but it's incredible all the other spies saw only the big guys we are like grasshoppers in our own eyes and so they hopped around the desert like grasshoppers for 40 years 
Two guys from that generation, after 40 laps around the mountain, come back to the same place, Joshua and Caleb. I can see him now. He's 80 plus years old. You were introduced this morning to John Bankowski. He's my spiritual papa. All my friends are old. I mean, old. <laughs> Just true. You, you were talking about his hair. I was in a room one time, and he walked in, and I said, I leaned over to my friend, and I said, I hope I look that good when I'm his age. He goes, you don't look that good now. <laughs> But I've been blessed with guys like John, spiritual papas, octogenarians, who are still dreaming. Yeah, yeah. So I can see the picture. You want to come help me a minute? Sure. You be Joshua. Okay. Caleb walks up to Josh. Remember when we was here for? We saw that stuff. That's pretty rough territory over there. So here's what I want you to do. Give the easy stuff to the kids. Give me the mountain. Yeah, yeah. Give me the mountain, Josh. I'll take the mountain, and you'll have the high places. So go ahead and let these kids that don't know anything yet, let them go out there and do Jericho and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Give me the mountain. Yeah. That's exactly the kind of thing that needs to happen in us. In Acts chapter 2, Luke quotes Joel chapter 2, and he says this, when the Spirit falls, it will fall on all people, all kinds of people, but he makes this statement, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. I think that's backwards, because visions are about what God is doing now. Dreams are about what God has not yet done. Wouldn't you give the dreams to the young guys that have the time to get there? But God says, no, that's not how it works in my kingdom. Because old people never run out in my kingdom. They just run and fall off the end. So it doesn't matter if you're young, old, rich, poor. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your race. It was God's intent that now, through the church, he would make known his manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heaven, heavenly places. All of heaven is waiting to learn what you know about God. And all of earth, according to Romans 8, is groaning and travailing for the unveiling of the sons of God. My question to you is, are you willing to live a bigger life? with whatever life you have left. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, oh, I thank you so much for your power and your grace and your anointing, God. I just thank you for your life. I thank you for this place, this wellspring of hope. Thank you what it's meant to Diane and I. I thank you, Lord, that we sit here today in a, in a congregation with different colors and different ages and different, different people and different socioeconomic levels. But we are your people that you intend to become your dream come true. What I'm asking you, Lord, for today is fill us with your spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Fill us with your life and your love. If you would, just hold your hands out in front of you like you're receiving and just ask him. Holy Spirit, fill me. I want, a, I want your kind of life. I want your kind of love. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me with hope. Fill me with power. Fill me with peace. Fill me with shalom. Fill me with passion. Fill me with vision. Fill me with the Spirit of Jesus. So I will be like him. Mm. Mm. Lord, 
lift our eyes higher. Mercy. 